us think now about the effects of immobility on people that are otherwise healthy. If you take otherwise healthy people and put them to bed and make them immobile, then they start getting all sorts of problems, even without having an original disease condition. And it's interesting to notice that the effects of immobility on Earth are very much the same as the effects of weightlessness in space. So quite a lot of research has been done on this recently, looking into the effects of weightlessness. But no, no, we're not going to do that. Let's think about the effects of immobility on an otherwise healthy patient. And one effect to start off with is that immobility decreases metabolic rate. Now, the less active you are, the lower your metabolic rate becomes. And the more active you are, the higher your metabolic rate becomes. So if you want to lose weight, for example, you need to eat less fat and sugar. But as well as that, you need to increase your metabolic rate so that you're using up more energy, and you do that by exercising. So exercise increases metabolic rate, inactivity decreases metabolic rate. So if people that are on bed rest, their metabolic rate will decrease. That will tend to make them feel cold, and it will mean they stop using up the calories that they're normally using up. And sometimes that can result in obesity. So decreasing metabolic rate, slowing down of body functions, slowing down of the use of energy in the body, one of the effects of immobility on, on perfectly healthy people. So we're thinking about effects on healthy subjects. Deconditioning, they become deconditioned. Deconditioning can be described as loss of functional capacity, loss of the ability to get up and do things because of lack of use. And the first point we considered was that you get a decreased metabolic rate. Next point is decreased blood volume and red cell mass. Now, red cells carry oxygen around the body, of course, and red cells are produced in response to the release of a hormone from the kidney called erythropoietin, which stimulates erythropoiesis, the process of red cell production, in the bone marrow. And the kidney will release this hormone in response to oxygen lack in the blood. So if the patient's not exercising and there's not times where there is significant oxygen lack, then the stimulus to produce red cells will be reduced and red cell mass will start to drop. That takes some time to develop, but it will start. And also blood volume tends to be reduced as well. So reduction in blood volume, red cell mass. And remember, still talking about healthy people. That will occur in people that are otherwise perfectly healthy. So decreased metabolic rate, decreased blood volume and red cell mass. Increased urinary secretion of calcium, phosphorus and nitrogenous waste products. So think about it. Why do people on bed rest excrete more calcium in their urine? Well, the answer is that if there's no stress placed on bones, then those bones will start to demineralize. The calcium will leach out of the bones because the bones are not being stressed. The thing that builds bones up and makes them strong is the fact that there's stress going through them, that they're being used. If they're not used, if they're lying around, no stress going through them, then they'll start to demineralize and the patient will start literally, really, excreting the bones in their urine. The bones will decalcify. This is why astronauts have to spend a lot of time exercising to put stress on their bones because they don't have the stress that you and I have all the time as a result of gravity. But if someone's on bed rest, a lot of that stress is removed and they start to demineralize the bones and they start to lose bone mass and excrete that calcium in the urine. Much, is, much the same with uh, the, the phosphates as well. They can lose phosphates for the same reason. Now, what about the nitrogen? Why do people start excreting large amounts of nitrogen in their urine when they're immobilized? Well, nitrogen is a breakdown product of protein metabolism. And what happens when someone's on bed rest is they're not using the muscles, and the muscles start to atrophy. And as the muscles atrophy, muscle tissue is broken down. Muscle is, of course, protein. And the waste product of protein breakdown is, uh, one of the waste products of protein breakdown is nitrogen. So they'll excrete more nitrogen in the urine. So excessive, uh, increased excretion in the urine 
of calcium, uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. And going on from that point, it follows if the muscles are being broken down, there's going to be an overall decrease in muscle mass throughout the body. So there'll be a decrease in muscle mass. They'll start to lose muscles because they're not being used. In the same way if you use a muscle and exercise it, that muscle will tend to grow. They also have an increased pulse rate. Now let's think about this idea of an increased pulse rate. The more inactive someone is, the faster their pulse rate tends to become. The more active, the fitter, the more athletically fit someone is, the lower the pulse rate becomes. So someone who is very fit will have a low pulse rate. Indeed, someone who is athletically fit can have a pulse rate of 40 or 50 um, because they're very fit. And the reason for this is that the heart and the circulatory system are working very efficiently in someone who is fit. For example, the tissues of the body are able to take up much more of the oxygen from the blood uh, in a fit person than in an unfit person. So in an unfit person, the cardiovascular system is working inefficiently, therefore needs to work faster. So when you immobilise someone, the heart rate tends to increase. And the converse, of course, when someone is fit and doing lots of exercise, the pulse rate tends to decrease because it's working more efficiently. So in, in inactivity, pulse rate tends to increase over time, but it does tend to increase. So increased pulse rate. And then we come on to this vicious circle idea of immobility. The more immobile someone is, <clears throat> the less they want to mobilise. And after some weeks, people become very intolerant of change in position. So I've been nursing a patient recently uh, who's immobilised for a medical condition. And every time you go to move her, she is incredibly reluctant to be moved. When you go to exercise a shoulder joint or the physiotherapist comes in to exercise her, she finds this very, very uh, unpleasant and uh, in fact it almost seems to be painful for her. Uh, she just doesn't want to move at all. So the fact that someone has not moved for a long time means they become very reluctant to move. So reluctance to move is a feature of immobility. And of course, the more reluctant to move they are, the more immobile they become. The more they're immobile, the more they'll be reluctant to move. So the whole thing is a vicious circle. Once someone is immobilised, it, it, it tends to degenerate into greater immobility. So reluctance, uh, inability and reluctance to tolerate positional change. And the recovery rates from immobilisation are often quite long. It takes patients a long time to get back to fitness. So I've given you one example here. Recovery rates from a shoulder immobilised because of dislocation. Now, OK, I accept the fact the shoulder's been dislocated, so it's probably going to take time to, um, to, 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 to get over the initial pathology. But not, apart from that, recovery rates from a shoulder immobilised well, if the shoulder is immobilised for no days at all, then days to full recovery, about 18. And in fact, actually, this does show that it is the immobility that's the problem rather than the initial disease, actually. Because when it's not immobilised, it recovers fairly quickly. And this 18 days could be accounted for by the, by the trauma. But if it's immobilised for seven days, then it takes uh, 52 days to recover to full, to full activity. So no days, 18. Seven days immobilisation, 52 days to return to absolutely full uh, function. If it's immobilised for 14 days, then the time starts going up quite dramatically. 121 days before it can move through its complete full range of movements. And if it's immobilised for three weeks, for 21 days, then an incredible uh, 300 days to return to full activity. So you can see that days in immobilisation take tens of days, take several weeks to, to recover. So you can see from this how important it is to minimise the time of immobility of part of the body 
or the whole body.